Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining the latest Abacus webinar, which, as you can see, is around sensory integration and, and bathing. Um, I'm just going to give people another 30 seconds or so to join before we get started, just to make sure as many people uh, don't miss the beginning as possible before I hand over to Jackie. So bear with me just for 30 seconds. If you do join and your video is set to automatically turn on, um, please just turn them off for me. Uh, it's just so that Jackie gets as much of the screen as possible. S still people entering, so just bear with me another few seconds and then I'll hand over to Jackie. Okay, let's get going. I know Jackie's got a lot um, to, to get through in the hour that we have, and we want to ideally have some live Q&A at the end. Um, before we get started, um, just to save lots of the questions about it, you'll get a copy of this presentation, and it will also be on the Abacus Academy website. You'll get a, there's, there's a link um, on there to be able to download your CPD certificate. As well, please use the chat box. As soon as I'm done with the introduction, um, I'll be on the chat. So uh, please leave any comments or questions on there. I'll answer as many as I can as we go. And any that are outside of my realms of expertise, I'll try and collate and put the jacket at the end. If we don't get time to, um, to get through all of the questions, I'll make sure that we collate them into sort of a, a, a FAQs document and we'll send that all out to you um, in the next week or so. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand over to Jackie um, for the next 45 minutes or so, and then I'll come back on at the end for a live Q&A. Like I say, please use the chat box for questions as we go. Um, Jackie, over to you. Perfect, thanks, Adam. Um, hi everyone, so today we will be talking about um, SI and bathing and just bridging the gap between these two. So just a bit of background. Oh, sorry. And um, just a bit of background about me. Um, I obtained my OT degree in South Africa in 2015, and I've worked in rural settings, hospitals, and schools. And I'm currently working for the London Borough of Sutton in a variety of mainstream and um, base schools, primary and secondary. So the learning outcomes we'll be looking at today, we'll be reviewing on what is meant by sensory processing and how we would interpret this information, reflecting on bathing as a sensory experience, and also looking at the evidence and applying our frameworks and models for our sensory processing. And then of course, to start discussing these strategies around an improved bathing experience and reflecting and looking at the evaluation of this. So if we have a look firstly at bathing and showering in general, why do we bathe and shower? What is this actually used for? So this could be used for a sensory experience, for relaxation, for keeping clean, improving our sleep, boosting our immune system, reducing stress or removing toxins and pain. This information was obtained from the new health advisor information. Personal cleanliness is therefore important for all of us. And the ability to bathe independently is considered important by OTs and our clients. Maintaining hygiene through bathing or showering is an activity of daily living that with disability or challenges can present as significant problems for many people. When we think of bathing and showering, we may initially think of the physical difficulties, including getting into the bath, getting out of the bath, possibly slipping, the risk of slipping, and being able to move appropriately in the bath to wash yourself. Add to this individual's preference regarding whether to bathe or shower, and the issue of maintaining independence and dignity because we look at clients holistically. As well as all of this, let's think about the sensory processing experience. According to Annette Thompson, who is an OT in America, who has worked with individuals with severe mental illness and more recently in the elderly with dementia, she has found that bathing or showering is often the primary activity of, of, of daily living where people are having difficulties. There may be many reasons why someone does not want to shower or bathe and many things to consider. 
Sometimes the reasons may be quite clear to the patient and the caregiver, and other times it may not be as clear, requiring an investigation, which is often the case with sensory needs, where we may need to alter the environment or alter the way in which these activities are actually performed. A robust assessment is needed to determine what recommendations to actually implement. So if we have a look at this pyramid, it's quite a nice representation of how our sensory processing systems are the foundation of everything else that we do, and it makes up quite a huge factor of, of our lives. And it's really important that we understand that this is very much involved in our routines of self-care necessary to, to maintain our health and our well-being. Um, as you can see at the top of this pyramid, we've got our activities of daily living, which would include our bathing and our showering. And we need to understand the necessary skills of how we dress, wash, feed, and groom. And in doing this, we acknowledge both the impact of our environment and our bodies on the ability to carry out these activities. And this process on how we integrate sensory and motor stimuli is a developmental process that's called sensory integration. So if we have a look at the senses, or if we define the senses, they, they tell us about our world around us. And if they work correctly, they are able to adapt to all the incoming information, which can be termed as habituation. This is the organization of our actions into patterns and routines governed by our roles and shaped by our environment around us. And if sensory systems are impaired, normal sensations can be unnoticed, uncomfortable, painful, or distracting, which can in turn impact on our behavior and our functioning. So what is sensory processing? This describes the way the body receives and interprets incoming stimuli through our senses to engage in the world around, world around us. But sensory sy systems play an important role in our ability to engage. Each sensory system has its own unique role and together they inform our brain how to react and interact with our environment. This process helps us to maintain a sense of position, level of alertness in different situations and our ability to move. Young people and adults may find information they receive through their senses challenging to interpret. Why does this therefore become a challenge? We all have different sensory preferences and there is a high degree of normal variance within the general population. Most of us are born with the ability to manage sensory information, organize it and respond appropriately. We only require support and intervention if our sensory processing is stopping us from doing what we want to do and to interact in our daily lives. If the sensory information is not processed smoothly, we might pay too much attention to the unnecessary sensory information or not enough attention to sensory information to perform activities, to feel calm and to pay attention to our environment. So if we look at what the research says, um, Jay Ayers, which is the, who is the founder of our sensory integration framework in 1970, published two books on sensory integration and learning disorders within the child. She believed that sensory integration is the organization of sensations for, for us. She described the behavioral problems associated with inadequate sensory integration. This was later added in terms of the evidence in 1980, where it was suggested that planned sensory input provided through specific activities could help to normalize reactions to sensory input. And later in 1993, individuals, it was said, have that have difficulties registering, modulating, and integrating sensory stimuli. And this may contribute to self-stimulating behaviors and irregular arousal levels. So we can see how the research has it's been improved and added on year after year. The core feature of our humanity is sensory processing. And when we understand the nature of our sensory processing needs, we are able to get information for constructing routines and context in our daily life, which is why this is so important. If we have a look at this example um, on interpreting our sensory information in this um, context, so the, the activity is considering what would happen if you put your foot into a bath of very hot water. So if we look at this and we break it down into task analysis, there is a protective reaction that you would withdraw from the source of the heat. You would take action to reduce this heat. So you would take your foot out of the bath and maybe run it under cold water. And there would be an emotional reaction to the pain. So you may show annoyance or avoidance of further risk. And all these three processes demonstrate involvement of SI and is sensory integration. So we interpret the sensory information um, in this example below. So if we have a look 
we are using sensory registration because we're identifying the bath as hot, sensory modulation and responding to the heat by a physical response, so withdrawing our foot, and an emotional response, which could be which leads to a heightened level of arousal. Sensory discrimination as well, to be able to make the judgment to maybe go back to the bath at a later stage when the water has cooled. So from Ace's observation when working with children, she identified that a subgroup of children with sensory processing difficulties had difficulty interpreting the sensory information from their body and the environment. Whereas in most situations, we can control our reactions. So if we had to consider the following types of sensory experiences that may be present in when we bathing or, or showering, um, just consider these couple of examples. So how would you feel when you smell the bubbles in a bubble bath? How would you feel sitting in a warm bath? And what would happen when water gets into your eyes during bathing and showering? So some of your responses to the above would be momentarily positive reactions or maybe a negative reaction if you get soap in your eyes. But for some people with sensory processing difficulties, adverse responses can result in negative reactions that pose significant problems for occupational performance and sometimes their avoidance in engaging in these tasks. So this um, flow diagram shows how sensory processing actually occurs. So we would be taking in the sensory information using all of our sensors, which we'll discuss in the next slide. And then our brain figures out and integrates what all of these sensors actually mean and how they affect us. From that, the brain can then work out what to do, and this will lead to our, our motivation and our drive to perform a task. We will also use our past experiences and our memories, which comes into habituation and being able to apply previous experiences to a new experience. And of course, getting feedback from other people, from our environment in order to attend to the task and to perform in a functional way. So these are the seven senses I'm sure everyone is very familiar with. Um, we also know that there are an additional two senses, which is our proprioception and vestibular sense, and which isn't always spoken about, but these all help us to engage in the world around us. So if we look at proprioception, this is our sense of body awareness and vestibular is our movement, balance and coordination. And all of the above are integrated so we can carry out these activities. Sensory processing occurs at a conscious and an unconscious level, by which an activity, for example, running a tap, would involve seeing and hearing the water, seeing if it's running too fast or too slow, and of course touch if the water is too hot or too cold, and then this would, um, and get, uh, would contribute towards an adaptive response. So what happens when these sensors get a little bit confused and our brain is not able to actually integrate them correctly? So what happens is this information is obtained and the brain struggles to understand this information that we are getting from different senses around us in our environment. Then this wrong information is actually sent to our body and in turn, our bodies don't always behave in an appropriate way or may act out of the ordinary. And this of course impacts on our functioning and carrying out our self-care or ADL tasks. And for those living with sensory processing disorders, the sensations that come with moving through the world can often at times feel so extreme that common sensory experiences may feel quite overwhelming and threatening. And of course, this is going to interfere with their ability to behave and function in their environment. So if we have a look at a couple of these examples that just show different sensory experiences in the bathroom environment and how people would maybe be affected by these experiences. So it could be um, the sound of the bath filling up, um, could be the sound of the bathroom echoing, possibly hair being washed and water going into the eyes, being able to discriminate between temperatures or bright lights in the bathroom. These are just a couple of examples of stimuli that could be overwhelming for a person. And um, so the, the type of population who would have more extreme patterns of sensory processing is listed above. And I think one of the most common ones that we all deal with as OTs is autism. And as we know, people with ASD have a pattern of significantly different registration. And within this pattern, these children may fail to notice stimuli, which is difficulty with registering. And then when the sensory input is strong enough for them to notice, they may even withdraw, demonstrating avoiding behavior. This pattern makes it really challenging for children to respond appropriately or adults who may have autism. 
And when intense sensory responses are combined with other characteristics of particular disabilities, so possibly a communication challenge that goes that coincides with autism, adaptive responses can be challenging. When therapists and families can understand the meaning of the behavior from a sensory processing perspective, then they can create a more sensory friendly environment for these individuals and thus increasing the chances for more successful participation and adaptation in different situations. Bathing is definitely a sensory experience and it can be fun and can help the bedtime routine or to wind down. However, for children or individuals with sensory sensitivities, this activity can be emotional and anxiety provoking. Individuals with postural or motor planning difficulties may feel insecure sitting and moving around the bathtub. An over-responsive individual may not like the feeling or the sound of water and may even interpret these as alarming or threatening, making the whole experience really intense. The tactile input of warm water, foamy bubbles, slippery slope, mixing with the smell of shampoo, as well as the, as the sound of water splashing can be very overwhelming, result, resulting in individuals not wanting to engage in this experience. Scheduling bath times at a certain time of day can be helpful so that it is predictable for the individual, making it part of their bedtime routine and making it quick but not rushed. Developing a predictable routine with visual prompts for washing so they are aware of what order it will happen will increase their ability to participate in this task successfully. If we have a look at the sensory processing experience and bathing, there are three main sensory systems affected, although all systems are affected, these are the three main ones. So if we look at the tactile sensory system, this dictates how we interpret the information we get from the receptors on our skin. And it helps us understand temperature differences, pressure, pain, texture, and touch. The vestibular system refers to the, develop the development of eye movements to track objects and structures within the inner ear that detect movement and positional changes of the head. This can present as either hypersensitivity when a person has fearful reactions to ordinary movement and can result in an exaggerated response. In the bathing scenario, this can result in maybe the person being um, feeling unstable if surfaces in the bathroom are uneven, or even feeling unsure in terms of inclines or climbing into the bath and out of the bath. This may be quite um, anxiety provoking for them. On the other side of the spectrum, if they are hypo-responsive to vestibular feedback, this is when they seek intense experiences. So they may seek more movements such as running, jumping, and spinning. This may result as, um, this may put them in, in danger in a bathroom situation with risk of slipping or falling, um, which can be, which can be quite fearful, which can be quite fearful for people who are looking after them in the bathroom, and as well as the proprioceptive system, and um, which provides the person with the subconscious awareness of the body's position. And common signs of dysfunction in this area include maybe a tendency to fall, or feeling unsteady on their feet, difficulty manipulating objects, and a lack of awareness of their body position. All of these can cause autism and bathroom issues, especially if someone is left unattended in this high risk area. The next part of the, the webinar, what I've done is I have looked at a task analysis of um, the bathing activity. And as OTs, it's really important to look at step-by-step -step analysis of activities because this helps our clinic, clinical reasoning. Um, and it's a tool that we use to evaluate our performance. So we look at this in relation to the person, the task and the context and later using the PEO model, which we will talk about at a later stage. So if we have a look at the slide, we can see that and there are different steps involved in the bathing process. So turning on water to the proper temperature, determining hot and cold, which would be our tactile discrimination, hearing the water running would be our auditory system, washing our body is the person able to tolerate different tactile inputs, smelling shampoo or soap is our olfactory system, using washcloths again as tactile input, leaning the head back to wash hair is our vestibular input, washing hair using a wash face cloth again, tolerating more tactile input as well as using a towel. So I think this analysis really does break it down and show us that every single sensory sense is used in terms of the bathing experience. If we have a look at what the research says, um, there's lots of literature that describes sensory processing in young children and suggesting the importance of this knowledge for understanding the characteristics of vulnerable children. And this research was carried out by Winnie Dunn. 
Professionals and families need a working knowledge about sensory processing, which is what she discovered, because this enables them to understand and to interpret children's behavior and to tailor everyday activities so children may have successful experiences. This article reviews Dunn's model of sensory processing. Dunn and her colleagues tested the relationship, relationship between a person's nervous system and their self-regulating strategies at different ages with people with disabilities as well as people without disabilities. And they looked at how the interaction of these functions creates four basic patterns of sensory processing. This result, the result is what, that the patterns occur in each age group from infancy to adulthood. And people with disabilities are seen to have more of a distinctive and more intense pattern of processing than people without disabilities. Sensory processing knowledge is useful for planning interventions that support children to have successful experiences in their everyday activities. This article is broken down into three parts. Firstly, there is a review of Dunn's model of sensory processing. Second, it presents the behavioral patterns, which we have turned, she has turned into four different categories. And then lastly, there is discussion on how to apply these different categories and to actually So Dan's model um, was based on research of a thousand, over a thousand children with and without disabilities. And she hypothesized that there is a relationship between a person's nervous system operations and self-regulation strategies. And that the interactions of these functions creates four basic patterns. What they found is that these patterns occur with people with autism, ADHD, developmental delays, and learning disabilities. And this pattern is more intense compared to people who don't have these challenges. So she has found that we all have sensory thresholds. This is the point at which there is enough input for us to activate, to, to activate and to be able to be alert to our environment around us at an appropriate level. When a stimulus is strong enough to trigger the threshold, it causes activation, which is when you notice your stimuli around you. When a person has a low sensory threshold, this means that the person will notice and respond to stimuli quicker because the system is readily activated to those sensory events. So if we break this down into a bit of an easier way of understanding, if we think about this in terms of our cup analogy, so if you have a low sensory threshold, your cup doesn't need to be filled as much. It only needs a little bit of sensory input for you to be able to reach your arousal level. Whereas on the other side, if your cup is higher and you have a high sensory threshold, you need more input and to be able to register in your environment and to be able to reach an appropriate level of arousal. It is important to understand self-regulation as at one end of the spectrum, people may have a passive strategy and they may let things happen around them and then react. So for example, a child may become irritable in the bathroom listening to the water fill up in the bath. It is a passive self-regulation strategy to remain in this environment, even when they feel uncomfortable from all the sounds around them. At the other end of the scale, a person may utilize an active strategy and they may tend to do things to control the amount and type of input that is available to them. So for example, this, the same example of that child, they may remove themselves from the bathroom where there's a lot of noise stimuli to a place where it is less overwhelming. So they will take an active response, an active self-regulating strategy to adjust their position and to be able to obtain a manageable amount of sensory stimuli. If we break um, Dunn's strategies and behavioral responses down into the four um, categories, we can see that we firstly have sensory seeking categories and these people use active self-regulation strategies. So when someone has sensory seeking patterns, they derive the sensory, this from sensory sensations in everyday life. So for an example, they will look for physical movement or they may look for increased sound. Sensory seekers will also look for additional sensory experiences that themselves. So they may be the individuals who hum, them, who hum or they may um, make noises themselves to obtain more seeking, more sensory input. Then avoiding, um, then low registration. Um, this is the sensory pattern where people do not notice sensory events in daily life and they are passive response categories. So for an example, they may be the oblivious individuals in the environment who may not be as responsive or notice sensory stimuli. They may not notice when they have washed the shampoo out of their hair or whether the soap is off their bodies completely. Then we have the sensitive category 
This is people and their sensory patterns are where they are easily distracted by sounds or movement or smells. They may feel discomfort with certain textures of a sponge and they, this high rate of noticing and continuing an experience, all of these passive responding strategies. And avoiding the person in this pattern will find different ways to reduce sensory input throughout the day. They use an active response strategy, meaning they would purposely try to avoid sensory input. So for an example, they would just not want to have their hair washed or their teeth brushed at all. Um, so I think it's also really important to note that although there are specific patterns and quadrants where different types of regulation strategies and their responses are broken down, it is important to note that not everyone has only one pattern of sensory processing. When considering the different sensory systems, a person might be highly sensitive to touch, but may have low registration for sounds. So it may look different with different sensory stimuli. Um, there is evidence that supports Dan's model of sensory processing. So the researchers, they tested the valid validity and reliability of her model of sensory processing by conducting studies of children and adults with and without disabilities across the lifespan. They used three appropriate questionnaires, which was the infant and toddler sensory profile, the child sensory profile, as well as the adult one. And each of the questionnaires contained statements about how a person might respond to a sensory event in everyday life and the respondent records how frequently that behavior occurs on a five-point scale. It is important to review the responses and provide some ideas about how to create a more successful sensory context for the children. And in Dan's case, using these sensory profiles really helped with her validity to prove that the sensory processing system worked in her SI framework. As OTs, we also usually use the PEO model in terms of planning and our intervention, and this shapes our intervention. So this in in includes the person, the occupation, and the environment. The person domain includes the person's roles, their background, how they respond to sensory input, maybe their health and their personality. The occupation refers to um, what they are engaging in. So this could be self-care activities, it could be play, it could be going to work. And their environment is the environment that these activities are performed in. So this could be their physical environment, social, um, or their cultural environment. The three domains are dependent and affected by each other. And in this model, the overlapping area of the three domains shapes occupational performance. Therefore, this model can be viewed as an assessment tool to understand and analyze problematic areas that affect clients' occupational performance, or as an intervention tool to shape our, our intervention. As well as using the PEO model, we also look at the sensory integration frame of reference in terms of, with our OT practice. And this focuses on interaction between the sensory systems providing integrated information that contributes to our learning and functioning and be able to adapt these behaviors in different environments. The outcomes of sensory integration processes consists of our ability to modulate, discriminate, and integrate sensory information in our environment to be able to regulate and maintain our arousal levels, to be able to focus on a task and then for task completion, practice and organization of our behavior, development of our self-esteem, and these outcomes will eventually lead to successful participation in our occupations. Interventions using the SI frame of reference include use of therapeutic equipment to provide children with various sensory opportunities. Sensations are provided in a structured environment and graded to a greater or lesser intensity, depending on what the child's individual needs are. If we then have a look at the principles of the SI framework, I'll just touch on a couple of these and why this is important. So the framework looks at um, our information and provides an important foundation for learning, as we saw in the initial slide with the pyramid. Our SI is right at the bottom and is the foundation for every other skill that we build onto that. And feedback and knowledge is, enhances our ability to be able to react effectively. This is a developmental process that occurs in a sequence and based on experiences that we have previously had. <clears throat> it further is developed by an adaptive response. Again, our habituation, drawing on previous experiences and then applying this to further um, demands, as well as seeking meaningful experiences from the environment. Enriching experiences affect change in the nervous system and sensory integration is the foundation for our participation in our routines. 
So in terms of our SI framework and our PEO model, this is what facilitates where we go to in OT and what we base our reasoning as well as our valuations on. So if we then have a look at um, how we would bridge the gap now between supporting these people who have difficulties with um, their bathing, um, what, what would we do? So therapists would therefore consult with families to identify the challenging routines for these individuals that they work with, and then to construct strategies in order to adjust daily routines so they can accommodate to the individual's needs while allowing them to participate effectively in their everyday lives. When families and providers are able to understand the meaning of individuals' behaviors from a sensory perspective, we can then create more sensory-friendly environments for these individuals to be able to manage their situations effectively. So how would we do this? We could encourage um, families to keep a diary in order to determine what the individual may be seeking or avoiding in the senses and what their bathing experience look like, looks like over time as well as thinking about the environment and how this relates to our sensory processing. So thinking about, is there carpets, are there mats? Um, is the noise in the bathroom very echoey? Um, does the individual lack the sound of running water? Are there bright lights? Is there relaxing music? So really looking at the environment as a whole and how we could possibly adapt this. Then looking at the whole bathing experience. So the build up to it during the experience and then afterwards and how we can change this to meet the individual's needs. So possibly before bath time, you could provide deep touch inputs as this is always calming and grounding. And the upset before getting into the bath could maybe be with, do, with um, getting undressed, which could affect, um, which could be to do with the temperature. So making sure the room is the right temperature, letting them test the water with their fingers, and again, doing deep pressure touch. And making the transition from getting undressed and into the bath as quick and smooth as possible. These are just some suggestions to think about in terms of the buildup. And then, of course, during the bathing experience, so possibly providing the individual with more control, letting them choose the sponge, having them look at a, a mirror in order for them to see what is happening when they're washing themselves in terms of body awareness and body mapping. And if they do not like the water in their eyes, thinking of possible adaptations such as a visor or goggles, and then thinking about what happens after the bath, so how this can be effective and quick in terms of um, maybe applying deep pressure when towel drying them off and getting into their clothes as quickly as possible. So looking at how these three um, activities are done in the process of bathing. Um, also to encourage a positive experience and making it fun and not rushed. And especially for those who seek sensory stimuli, why not let them have messy play, taking toys out of their interests with, or different tactile experiences. And then of course, we as OTs would come in in terms of our observation looking at standardized assessments, as well as basing all of this on our framework and models and breaking down tasks into task analysis. So in terms of um, Dunn's research that we had discussed previously, she had found um, different strategies that could be used for different pieces of intervention and planning within these environments. So this is based on the research that she found and she has divided her strategies into the sensors and she has spoken about them in terms of whether the child presents with more seeking um, behaviors or low registration. Um, and she's thought about strategies for all of those type of four quadrants that we've spoken about. So for the first one, this was children who miss bathing cues. Um, so with more intensity of sensory input, she had discovered that these children can pay attention for a longer period of time during these activities. So this table provides some examples for how the sensory experience can be um, encouraged for these individuals and they can have more seeking experiences. So you can refer to the table on the screen. Um, they've also considered a case study when applying these strategies to see if this would be effective. So the case study was about a little girl whose mother was very frustrated with getting her awake and dressed in the morning because she wasn't contributing to helping with um, bathing and then dressing. So um, she had made several attempts to, to wake up her child in the morning, but she was just not alert and not participating in these activities. So once the OT had come in, she had done observations and she had used her sensory profile and determined that she, this little girl was missing a lot of cues in the environment. So what was done instead to increase her sensory experience and to assist with her being able to register what was going on is they had um, open curtains in the morning, turned on the radio, selected brightly colored and textured clothing, 
And then during bath, bath time, they had enhanced the experience by providing te textured soaps, as well as bath toys and scented bath products to try and make her experience um, more enhanced and for her to be able to increase her alert levels. The second quadrant that Dunn looked at was um, children who are seeking information. So this requires more intense responses, meaning the children enjoy sensory experiences and they need more of the sensory input. So they have interest in playing, um, they have the children's interest in pleasure with sensory events might also lead to difficulties with task completion because they may, may get quite distracted with the sensory input that's happening in the environment and they may lose track of being able to complete a task. So they have been provided with more opportunities for sensory input. Um, and a lot of these strategies were quite similar to the previous one, which was low registration, because if we can remember, both of these um, quadrants require increased input for them to be able to function at a level of appropriate arousal. So these strategies will be similar to the previous block. Um, another case study that Dunn had carried out was about a little boy whose father was having difficulty getting him through bath time successfully. So again, the therapist met with the father and they had discussed different strategies based on observation, clinical reasoning, and of course the assessment um, uh, profile that was conducted. And the therapist and the father made a schedule for bath time activities and placed a laminated copy of the schedule on the bath wall, as well as providing more intense sensory experiences. So again, using scented bath products, soap and crayons, so these additional items increased the intensity of the sensory experience, but the schedule helped to focus the child on being able to complete the task within an efficient time, um, time frame. The next part of our, um, the next part of our the quadrants was children who tend to avoid sensory stimuli. So when children have a more intense response and sensation avoiding, this means that they notice things much more than others. And because these children notice more, one might observe that they may isolate themselves or become more anxious more quickly. When environments are too challenging, these children may withdraw and therefore not get activities completed in daily life. So the example, the case study that Dan had completed um, in this quadrant was a little girl whose parents were concerned about her play behavior as she was more concerned with playing independently with repeated and repeatedly played with the same toys. Again, the OT came in, did observations and used her sensory profile. And it was identified that this child avoided sensations, which is why she preferred to play independently so that she would not get bumped easily by other children and she would have to then deal with those unpredictable tactile experiences. This then occurred in bathing as well, as she didn't like the sound of the bath and as well as different tactile experiences. So what they had done is the bath was then drawn before the child entered the room. They used unscented soaps and bath time occurred at the same time every single day with a schedule. So this was very predictable for the child and therefore caused less stress and anxiety. Um, and lastly was the sensitivity quadrant. Um, and again, this is very similar to the avoiding where not as much sensory input is needed before reaching that level of arousal. So these strategies are quite similar to the previous ones as well. And understanding the four basic patterns of the sensory processing enables us to interpret behaviors and therefore tailor activities and interventions to support children with their everyday life. <clears throat> so sensory challenges um, in children, well, in children and in adults may appear as the following. So we may see um, impaired balance and distress and maybe stepping out of the bath due to poor vestibular or proprioceptive processing, difficulties adjusting to change in water temperature due to tactile modulation difficulties, aversive response in components of bathing and showering, maybe tactile sensitivities, and aversive response to, to tipping the head backwards. And again, we're looking at vestibular difficulties due to gravitational insecurity. They may also appear as fear of the water, distress over the water being too cold or too hot, um, difficulties maintaining bodily control on slippery surfaces, instability from stepping in and out of the tub, and possibly panic over the sound of the plug hole. I know we've, we've looked at a lot of um, strategies and challenges in terms of children with ASD, and that was what Dan's um, research was based on. But I thought just to also touch on sensory integration challenges with dementia. 
And this will just be touched on because we probably will be talking about this in more detail in a, a webinar that will be upcoming. Um, but if we can just have a look at this, if we think about our patients that have dementia, they often go through um, difficulty in processing sensory stimuli because of changes of their sensory processing later in, in their diagnoses. And this can affect their ability to complete their ADLs and therefore results in an, a decline in these activities. And this could look like possibly physical abilities and difficulty with balancing and motor planning, as well as what we've been talking about with the senses. So that they may experience changes in these senses. So this can be quite challenging for these people because they may have depth perception problems that make it scary to step into the water. They may not perceive a need to bathe or they may find it too cold or the whole sensory experience quite uncomfortable. And if it is uncomfortable and unpleasant, they may resist this activity that needs to be carried out. So just looking at a couple of strategies for these type of individuals. Um, so if we look at preparing the bathroom in advance, taking into account their sensory needs. So possibly having pleasant sense, preparing the bath if sound is difficult to process, soft pads for the, the shower seat so this isn't uncomfortable, or maybe playing soft music. Possibly also gathering bathroom supplies, especially if there's a practice or balance difficulty to make this quite easy for them to reach. Monitoring and checking the water temperature because um, these individuals may not be able to determine the difference between hot and cold and encouraging the individual to feel in control. So giving them a role and maybe encouraging them to hold, a sp hold the sponge or to give them a choice between bathing or showering where this is appropriate. Um, long phrases may also be difficult to process in terms of a, a loud bathroom where sounds echo. So to give really simple instructions will make this easier. And then of course, um, sensory discrimination. They may not be able to accurately identify details of things that they see, hear, or, or touch or feel. So how could we support this? How could we modify their environment? So we could maybe label bottles, color bottles, or place them in the sequence of how they should be used in the correct order, just to make their lives a bit easier. If we then have a look at our um, strategies in terms of our different sensors, um, so these are these can be used for adults as well as for children, obviously, um, where, where it's appropriate. So if we have a look at the first one, which is our body awareness now proprioception, what could we do to help make the, the bathing experience a bit more bearable? So we could have heavy face cloths or sponges with pressure stro strokes downwards to reduce defensiveness if the individual has um, tactile sensitivities, possibly wearing a bathing suit in the tub to add pressure, especially if the feel of the water is really uncomfortable, using pressure when drying with a towel and, and wrapping your child up tightly, as well as providing heavy work activities during the bathing experience. So maybe squeezing toys or sponges or pouring water from one bucket to another, as well as heavy work activities prior to bathing. So depending on the age category, you could look at possibly lifting boxes, carrying groceries, packing cupboards, or jumping on the trampoline, as this is really grounding and offers stability before maybe a stressful activity such as bathing. Then having a look at praxis or motor planning, we could use visual aids to assist with this task. We could break skills down into smaller tasks using our task analysis as OTs. We could model how to complete washing tasks, so the sequence of it, starting from the top and working our way down. We could have long-handled sponges to make it easier to access different parts of our body, especially if balance is difficult. And labeling items to remind the individual which bottle to use first. Consider how we could make individuals feel safer in the bath as praxis may interfere with their feelings of insecurity. And of course, using a timer so individuals will know how long that they've washed for to encourage predictability. Then of course, we have movement, which is our vestibular. Um, if, the, if the individual is sensory seeking, we could allow them to do running or jumping or other kind of fast paced activities before bath time. If they are over responsive to sensory input, we could, depending on the size of the individual, we could wash them in a baby bath, if this is for a child, to make them feel more secure. We could use a bath mat or a bath seat so the individual is less likely to slip around. We could use grab bars to feel more secure if balance is difficult. And important to note that if discomfort and changing head positions may cause um, trauma or anxiety, to maybe look at how we could do this in a different way. So rather, 
um, covering their, their eyes with a face cloth or a foam bar, a visor or goggles so that the individual won't need to tip their head back, especially if they have feelings of gravitational insecurity. And then of course, to dry in front of a mirror to increase your body map and awareness. Then of course, um, strategies for, for touch. So we could start with um, washing um, the face before getting into the bath or the shower and to also be aware of temperature of, of water and what the individual prefers and what is also safe. Using firm pressure downwards on, on the child's shoulders while bathing them as this is a calming strategy, um, as well as using face cloths or bath mitts with constant pressure and also looking at what the child or the individual can tolerate. With children, if they are sensory seeking, to possibly look at bath paints, crayons, tactile soaps and fidgets and have items that encourage heavy work for the muscles, so squeezing sponges. Um, if water is not tolerated over their bodies, a shower may be better as the water moves in a consistent direction, or possibly to place plastic rings over their ears and around their heads to keep unpredictable water from running into their faces. Continuing with, continuing with um, tactile strategies, We've got um, using the shower sprayer for, for rinsing and allowing the individual to do this themselves to give them control, using a rain shower head or a towel warmer, using heavy towels for drying to encourage the firm pressure again. Um, and if the individual is overly sensitive to possibly use a smaller towel, which can be directed and, and manipulated easily. Res resistant activities or deep pressure activities prior to bath time and also, it's important to consider that if the child struggles with bathing, maybe to try showering and vice versa. The tactile input from a shower can be quite stimulating and maybe is preferable to use rather in the morning when we want to alert ourselves, rather than using this for the wind down bedtime routine. Looking at our auditory strategies. So if the sound of the running water bothers the individual to maybe fill the bath before you bring them into the room, Tell your child where you are going to wash them, possibly using earplugs, having plenty of fabric to kind of break down the sounds that are echoing in the bathroom. So whether that's using towels or curtains or bathrobes, playing calming music and of course singing songs. And then visual strategies to allow the individual to look into a mirror whilst in the bath to increase predictability, using waterproof pictures or visuals to help them with understanding the sequence of the task, dimming bathroom lights or LED lights, projectors to present for um, visual seeking individuals. And of course, using a visual timer so that they can identify how long this will take for them to complete the task. And the last two things we're gonna be looking at today is just two studies that I thought were really interesting and quite relevant to this topic. So the first one was um, carried out in 2021, so very recent, and the purpose of the study was to identify whether differences exist between children with ASD and neurotypical development, and relating this in terms of their ADLs and sensory processing. Um, and this study was carried out in Spain. So what they did is they were, there was a descriptive cross-sectional study. They looked at 40 children, 20 with a diagnosis of ASD and 20 with neurotypical development and they used different measurement tools to perform this um, as listed below. Again, the sensory processing measure was used, um, which is what we've spoken about previously. And this can also be used for all ages. Um, and their results were really interesting. So it suggested that ASD experience, experiences problems of sensory reactivity, and those problems are likewise related to difficulties in performing their ADLs. Um, the study was then further carried on and extended by Case Smith and Weaver, and they had evaluated children with ASD and sensory difficulties, and they conducted that the group that received OT treatment obtained better results for self-care and functional independence. So as a conclusion to the study, it has been pointed out that these children require greater support from their caregivers and modification to their environments and the use of supportive resources. Um, and of course, it was proved that this all, which was obtained by OT treatment, resulted in increased performance and more adaptive performance, which shows the placement of OT in um, sensory integration and, of course, assisting these individuals with changing environments and changing the way they do things. And it really does validate um, our input as therapists. Then the last study was talking about, um, it was a case study which was performed with one child. Um, conducted in 2007, and the goal of the study was to prove 
that intervention can improve the child's ability to process and integrate sensory information and to use this in activities of daily living. So the method that they used was a sensory ass assessment. Um, and then of course, the parent interview where the mother of the child was able to identify areas of concern. And this was listed up as goals that were set for OT targets. Um, and then information was collected weekly and was put into a chart or a, um, a diagram. Um, a parent, the parents then interview was conducted during the final month of intervention to obtain input about the child's past and present occupational concerns and the success of OT and the SR program in meeting this child's needs. Um, again, the sensory profile was used to assess the child's behavior and the sensory basis and goals were developed in collaboration of using the profile, as well as talking to mum and what mum had said were the main concerns. And what had come up with this child was he was very hypersensitive, um, which affected his ability to play as well as complete um, different self-care tasks, such as bathing, brushing his teeth and brushing his hair. So what the results had shown um, was his improvement in his ability to, to tolerate and process sensory input was striking and apparent in home and in the community. His decrease in fear of movement and tactile stimuli results in him being able to play at an age appropriate level, as well as enhanced opportunities in the sense in the, the hygiene environment. And he also progressed from unwillingly participating in climbing and movement to playfully enjoying activities, as well as hygiene activities with less fuss. So this definitely shows that there was an improvement in the ability to process and integrate sensory input using the SI approach which will influence our adaptive behavior and occupational performance and validates um, our framework that we use, the SI framework that we use as OTs. I mean, just in conclusion, I think the main points that I've spoken about in today's webinar, because I know there has been a lot, um, but it's just really important to understand how all the senses are integrated together and are really important in completion of our everyday tasks and how difficulties in, in understanding this information or our brain to be able to integrate it can affect the way we perform. And as OTs, especially in drawing up our, um, our plan, working with these individuals, we should be working with families too. And in doing this, applying our frameworks and our models, which will help our clinical re reasoning with our robust assessment. And from this, we can then understand the individual's ability to participate from a sensory processing perspective and using task analysis to see what is actually breaking them down from not being able to participate effectively. And then of course, using this knowledge to be able to implement environmental changes and maybe a difference in the way that individual completes a task and then reviewing and evaluating to see if this is something that can be carried on going forwards or if it needs to be changed. Um, thank you very much. I hope the, the research has been interesting with this. Um, I think a lot of the time we, we implement frameworks and models and we don't always know their validity, but actually looking at the research has been so interesting and especially updated research to, to show how this is effective and what we do as OTs in, in terms of our sensory processing is really important. Thank you. Thanks, Jackie, that was fantastic. So much for people to take in there. I think people have been so mesmerized and taken in by um, what you've been talking about. And I'm, I'm presuming taking notes furiously, but there haven't been an awful lot of questions specifically. Um, uh, but probably because we've also said that we're going to send out uh, or produce a document which looks at some ideas of strategies as well, um, which I think would be really helpful for people. Um, the slides, the presentation itself will be available on the Abacus Academy site. Um, as well as you're getting access to this uh, strategy document, which I think would be really useful. What I would say was I had a couple of um, direct questions about the idea of once we've done this, once we've done this fantastic assessment and we've come to the conclusion of what the person, um, adult or child, might benefit from, how do we then know what to actually put in place? And I think my response to that generally is that we need to, cut ourselves a little bit of slack sometimes and that we're expected to be both clinical experts and product experts. Um, and that's, that's not the case. Um, I would certainly say that I feel confident in being able to recommend uh, a broad idea of what somebody might need, but actually I need people like um, the guys at Abacus to be able to say, 
to go to them, Jackie, and say, this is, the, this is my breakdown of the task analysis and what the person needs from a sensory perspective. But then I'll say to them, what, what, what have you got? What do you do? What products do you have that would support that? And then I really look to them to provide that expert knowledge from their end. And I really think that's the sort of thing that we should do more often. So for example, you know, Abacus, certainly with, with the products, um, say like the, the Gemini product, you can get um, spar and lights and music features built into the products that that provide this sort of sensory stimulation and you can they, they can provide these um, postural support that would make somebody feel well held and supported in the in the environment but we're not expected to be experts in those things specifically is that the sort of thing you would you would suggest sort of being able to go to somebody and say this is what I think they need how would you help Yes, definitely. And that, yeah, again, it's, it's that whole working together. So getting a bit of information from what you've assessed and from families, seeing what we can offer and then going to the experts who, who know more information around this equipment and seeing what we can do to, because I mean, we're obviously the, the experts in the sensory processing. So we would know whether the child is seeking or, or avoiding sensory stimuli. So then we can take that information and see what products are available and what are out there working together collaboratively. Yeah, 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 that's really good advice. And my experience of doing that with Abacus has always been, been really beneficial. Catherine, um, I always asked a really good question that's just popped up, um, Jackie, which says, are the benefits of using SI equivalent to neurotypical and neurodi neurodiverse? Meaning, should consideration of SI be a major consideration for all assessments and not just when there's any kind of neurological deficit? And that's probably a question that we can't give a really in-depth answer to now but is that would that be your experience um i would say so so assessments i've conducted whether i'm conducting an assessment for sensory difficulties or not i would still use a sensory profile to identify issues that possibly may come up and i mean some of the the strategies could help with with children who don't necessarily have sensory difficulties but it could help with their routine could help with other elements so i think it's still really important to to follow that SI assessment process anyway, um, and especially in using the task analysis, because maybe it isn't actually a sensory difficulty that's impeding their function and, and completing a, an aspect of the task. Maybe it's actually something else, but it's important to explore all the, all the, all the elements. Yeah, and, and, and thanks for asking the question, Catherine, but I think it leads to, to, to a, um, a really good point of um, the idea of holism and client-centeredness within mm. any, any kind of assessment that we do. Obviously, in this instance, we're using bathing as the, as the example. And, and for Abacus on the Abacus Academy, we've got other presentations of things like bathing and sleep, um, where it's recommended that sleep's factored into every kind of assessment that we do because of the impact on physical and mental health. And we've got other webinars and presentations on there about other elements of occupation and occupational engagement, where we would always say, actually, these, these are things that should be included as, a, as part of a standard, holistic, client-centered assessment. And yes, we're gonna focus on things that come up um, as the most pressing potentially within those assessments, but we, we should never forget um, all of those other things. And what we're trying to do here with these webinars and with, it, with the Abacus Academy, with, with Abacus's support, is to provide people with a, a toolkit, I suppose, of strategies, uh, and tools to be able to go to someone, go, go to, to provide a, a, an occupational focused assessment and, and have little bits of, of knowledge of, of different areas that they can include as part of that holistic assessment. So I think Catherine's question probably leads quite nicely into that as well. We've, um, I haven't got time for any more, uh, but as I alluded to there, the Abacus Academy site is, is full of fantastic resources aimed directly at occupational therapists. So please go on there and take a look. This presentation will be on there in the near future as well. Um, lots of other things uh, uh, to, to have a look at there. Jackie, it's been fantastic. Um, I think you're probably ready for a break and a glass of water. Mm -hmm. um, and thank you for everybody for attending. I know you're, you're all really busy uh, clinically. Uh, so it's fantastic you've all been able to join us. Um, certificates are available on the Abacus Academy site. This webinar will be on there very soon. And like I say, lots of other resources for you to take a look at. So thank you very much. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again next month for our next topic. Thanks, Jackie. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.